this is a real pleasure to introduce Simon Buckingham Chum, and he's the director of the uh, Connected Intelligence Centre at UTS. And it was lovely to see Simon here today because um, I, I, look, this institution has really guided a lot of my career in the last few years. I, I've been lucky enough to, to spend some time there on their professional learning courses that they've delivered. So seeing and introducing him is a real privilege for me, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're presenting today. So can we please thank Simon for the best on the stage? Thanks very much, and uh, thanks all for coming. So, right now, companies are building big data and analytics and AI systems that your school or university will be buying in a year or two. And as educators who are passionate about how the system is going to evolve, we need to be sure they're inventing a future that we actually want to live in. Code, data, algorithms are assumptions coded. They're formalized assumptions about the world, about what we want to track about a student, about who should see that, about what kind of action someone might want to take from it. So we better understand how this stuff works. And so today, I'm not going to be giving you a rah-rah talk about big data and analytics and AI. We're going to be very specific and down to earth. I'm going to be talking about how we are developing those tools at UTS. I see no reason why these shouldn't be in schools in the near future. And particularly, how do we integrate this with practice? How do we actually build the trust of the academics, the educators, in these tools? I want to acknowledge the amazing team that I have because we can't do this kind of work without a very interesting mix of skill sets. Uh, all these slides, by the way, will be on my uh, blog um, at the end of today. So um, I put it out there. I said, folks, what do you think about, what do you feel when I say analytics and AI in education? And we got an interesting range of responses. And I'll let you read all of those, but, you know, shudder. That's a pretty strong reaction to a learning technology, right? Mind you... We might also say shudder when we think about our current educational infrastructure. After all, you know, only a small proportion of year 12s are on antidepressants, and only an even smaller proportion are committing suicide. There's good aspects, equity, excellence, worries about whether we will be able to interpret the stuff that's coming back from the machine. So maybe some of these resonate with you. It's certainly resonating with some people. Students and parents are protesting about personalized learning in the States. From the student body to Mark Zuckerberg, a letter complaining about the amount of time in front of the screen. The fact that they're not getting enough human support. They don't think it's really developing their critical thinking. Teachers' unions are starting to express concern. These are photos from a protest on the streets at Pearson's annual general meeting. Don't experiment on our kids with AI. Right? When we've got teachers' unions and parents and students worried about AI, we really need to know how to respond. One of my responses is, we've really got to have a trust-building conversation here. Right? You need to know enough about what's going on that you can actually make some informed views about this. And we certainly don't need a Luddite rebellion. So there are many leg legitimate concerns about AI, but there is a huge potential as well. And that's what I want to try and uh, show you today a little glimpse of. So even if we have some concerns about AI and technology, I hope we can all agree that one thing we do want to do is improve feedback, right? Timely evidence-based, personalised, actionable feedback. And that's, um, well, whose job's that? Oh, the teachers. So, teachers, please just work harder. The students need better feedback. More often, more detail, personalised to them. Well, that's, that's not really going to cut it either. So, I'd like to frame the AI analytics 
debate as one about how we close the feedback loop. If we could close the feedback loop, I think we'd all be a lot happier and a lot more convinced, and that's what I want to show you today. And let's take very seriously how are we going to integrate this into real teaching practice. Okay? It's one thing to have cool stuff running in the lab and to see an amazing demo. What's that going to look like on a Monday morning at 9 a.m. in your class? Do you know how to orchestrate and use that tool effectively? Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to a framework we've been developing to try and help co-design these tools with educators and get it into their teaching practice in a way that they feel confident and trusted. So on the left, we have educators. This is the world that all of you will be very familiar with. We're talking about assessment, rubrics, and designing meaningful student tasks. And then on the right, we have the tech people. They know how to identify interesting features in the data, and they know how to render that in a, in a useful way so it can actually be engaged with by a student or an educator. And if we can mesh these cogs coherently, and they all drive in the same direction, we have a coherent user experience. If those cogs are not meshing well, then it's going to feel incoherent. Why is this tool being used? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with the assignment. Um, why, why, does, why am I being asked to do this? It doesn't really fit with the task, etc. And we use co-design methods, well understood methods from the world of human-centered de design to help educators, who of course don't know anything about AI or data science, to help them have a voice in shaping that code. And you can read more about how we do that in those references at the bottom. Okay, so I'm going to give you two examples and our focus is on what you would call general capabilities in the school's world. We call them graduate attributes. Here's one, teamwork. Collaboration, teamwork. We all know how important that is. Everybody's excited about the importance of that. How do we assess it? How do we assess it not in an online platform, but when people are working face to face together? Because that's a pervasive human practice. Meetings and teamwork face to face are not about to go away anytime soon, despite the, the joys of the internet. Okay. Here's an example of a high performance team challenge. Nurses practicing different procedures around a mannequin patient. So there's an assessment. The, 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 the health faculty do this a lot already. They, use, they have well-defined student tasks where they have to do, but we are now instrumenting that space. The room knows what's going on inside it. That's an exciting development for educators when the room knows what's going on in terms of physiology, directional microphone for voice, uh, equipment tags um, on, um, so that we know when they're being used. The mannequin, of course, is streaming data. Okay. Now, the problem is, how do you give a team like that good feedback? How do you have a good debrief with them? Well, what we need to do is move from the world of data streams, okay? The stuff coming off that wristband is not going to make sense to anybody, except somebody who specializes in that kind of, you know, physiological data. Um, what we need to do is map from learning outcomes, right? We, the students need to learn about patient-centered care and effective teamwork. Then we break that down into subconstructs. So this still looks a bit like the kind of curriculum assessment design that you would be familiar with, okay? In this case, we, we have dimensions of collaborative activity. And then finally, we get to the multimodal data and there's a principled mapping. We can say that, you know, if the student is standing here and they're doing that, we're going to treat that as a proxy for a particular competence that we, we, we need them to display. Okay. Once we have designed that mapping, then we can design a feedback interface. Here's a timeline that's generated immediately after the simulation with three rows for re registered nurses one to three. We can see that they're using a device there for oxygen, that they administered some medication there. We have a critical incident where the patient loses consciousness, and then the patient states change in some way. And this is a replay interface to use for a higher quality conversation, reflection about what happened. And here's a little glimpse of what happened when we, we asked an educator to, uh, to give us feedback about this interface. So this is a really nice 
later in terms of that sort of delay in what's in what's happening. So there's been not a lot of you know. So there's been some pain assessment being done, but it has actually been um, taken a bit of time to actually get things going. Uh, this is interesting up here. This little uh, descriptor. Yeah, I think that's a really good point here. Um, we do want to know what the what the patient's base pulse oximetry is prior to the oxygen delivery device so that we can see um, whether there's been some improvement with that. So that's a really nice um, feature. Mm -hmm. I think this is really interesting physiological response work. Yeah. It's really interesting in terms of um, their responses and so it would be nice in terms of being able to say, okay, so we detected a physiological response here, so an increase in heart rate. Um, and what were you thinking in around about that time? So, you know, for RN1, um, you were doing a pain assessment and then you were about to do, um, put on the delivery device, uh, the oxygen delivery device. What was, the, what was the trigger there? What was going on in your head? And so that would be really interesting for them to reflect upon. But here, um, that all the RNs were beside the bed. I think there was a coin up here. Not at the top of the bed. Um, ideally, what we want to be able to see with with these resuscitations is someone who's going to do look after the airway and the breathing and the ventilation. That they will um, take the head of the bed off and they'll be literally at the top of the bed, mm -hmm. so that they're not in the way around the sides. Mm -hmm. um, that's always an issue um, for, um, I guess, novice resuscitation people um, but I think that's a really nice nice overlay here of what's going on okay so you can see there um, a way of interrogating what happened the system can't judge whether that was good or bad in some cases right is it good or bad to have an arousal peak where your electrodermal response is very high before doing something? Well, we could have a conversation about that. How were you feeling before you did that procedure? You know, what was going on here? You seemed incredibly calm. Was that, were you feeling disengaged or, or you know, did you not, were you not sure what your role was? Um, the point is to have a provocation to deeper reflection and, and, and discussion when we're talking about these very higher order competencies. And you can see the kinds of student reactions to this. These are just a couple of quotes there that show that they could make sense of the timeline and that they felt it was helpful to step out of the heat and reflect on how it had gone. Okay. And the educators are very excited about this. You just heard a little clip there from a professor of you know, clinical practice there. Um, again, if we can scaffold the reflection around this, this could be very powerful. So that's an example there of taking this ephemeral thing called effective teamwork and designing the data so that we map to proxies that correspond to the outcomes we're after. Okay, I'm going to move quickly on now to writing. We are very interested in how we can give instant feedback on writing. Um, and this is a little clip that shows how we introduce this to students at UTS, first of all. Research shows that learning to express your ideas in formal academic language is tough and that quick, detailed feedback can be really helpful. Unfortunately, nobody has the time to give you instant feedback on endless drafts any time of the day or night. So this is where artificial intelligence can help. You can ask for feedback 24-7, and it won't get tired or frustrated. Accurator is an advanced research prototype developed here at UTS, which means two things. Firstly, that it's backed by solid research. But secondly, it's not perfect, and we're learning how to improve it all the time. But don't worry, your assignment will still be graded by a human. Accurator is just here to give you tips to improve your drafts. And we encourage you to get feedback as many times as you want, and also to disagree if you think it's got it wrong, just like you would reject a poor spelling or grammar suggestion. But the point is, no academic has got time to give you feedback on your drafts over and over again at 2 a.m. in the morning. Okay? The goal here is not automatic grading. The goal is to teach the students what we mean by good academic writing. 
and to improve the quality of the submission before it goes in. One thing that we tell the students is, this is complicated stuff, it's just a machine, and it may get it wrong. Okay? The agency is on the student to make sure that they're not just crafting nonsense. The agency is also on the student to uh, push back against the machine and realize that this is an algorithm and it's going to get it wrong sometimes, just like it gets grammar suggestions wrong. Okay? This is even more complicated than grammar, I can tell you. Okay, what are we talking about? What is the machine doing? <laughs> Reflection is a graduate attribute that we have um, here at UTS and our students are required to reflect on their practice. So this is the context that we used for our Master of Pharmacy students. I mean, reflection is very hard to teach and it's difficult to learn, but it can be done. And with the theoretical framework that underpins this tool, it's, it's come from evidence. The tool works by using natural uh, language processing techniques, which means that the algorithms behind the tool uh, extract, extract certain, certain pieces, pieces of information, information that is related to the human uh, reflection response. And those um, extractions are tagged up and then the feedback comes with that tagging. So they're highlighted in different colours and different shapes and each tag relates to different uh, areas of reflection. So they can actually see what areas of reflection they actually fall down on. So it is actually a good tool for them to see and visualise in front of themselves. Now the output is actually very, very quick. So it's immediate output. Now when you have students that get immediate feedback, it's looking good. Okay, that is the goal. Immediate feedback to help you understand where your writing may be stronger or weaker. So here we talk about personal reflective writing. The students have been on a work placement in this case, but we want them to, to reflect deeply on what was it like actually working in a pharmacy. And they come up with all sorts of uh, experiences. So we have an assessment rubric, a good old fashioned rubric, and we have a number of features in the text, and we map to the assessment rubric. Okay. And so the, the tool gets its electronic highlighter pen out, and uh, is underlining and annotating with little icons, for example, different sentences. So the purple, the purple circle is something that was challenging for me, something that brought me up short or surprised me. Uh, the blue rectangle, the blue square, is just a description of, of something, uh, it's more a statement of fact about the context. And we've got underlining to do with feelings and emotions, other underlining to do with knowledge and beliefs. And the tool gives feedback as well to try and help the student figure out exactly what they should improve next. So that's reflective writing. But you will probably be more familiar with persuasive argumentative writing. That's the kind of analytical, critical writing in the third person that, that students spend a lot of time learning. Now, one of the things about academic writing, which we try and teach students, is that there are such th things we call rhetorical moves. Here's a rhetorical move. It's a contrast move. Okay? There are particular ways of signalling to the reader that I'm about to do a certain thing. Okay? In fact, there's a whole range of these moves, and you can read more about these. You know, background, summarizing, previously, uh, previous knowledge. Uh, summary, this paper will do the following. My report sets out to do this. To summarize, I have discussed. This paper has examined. Okay. Contrast, we're always looking for contrast. Where's your, where's your voice? How can you show that you can see that two ideas are disagreeing, or we've got some tension in, 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 the, in the results, perhaps. Questions around missing knowledge. Emphasizing for the reader what, they, what you want them to pay attention to. Talking about something new or expressing surprise. Or talking about a trend, either in the data or in the literature or in the ideas. Okay. So we have, for example, a law lecturer here who is explaining to students why they need to understand rhetorical moves because that's what a good lawyer does. They go into court, they take the same facts as the opposition and they express an attitude to it. And we show how the rubric match, maps in blue, again, to the features in the data and then we give examples to the students. And then we have a different interface which is tuned to different tags in 
analytical writing and different kinds of feedback. Again, all these slides will be up and you can look at these later on, plus videos. And we have a lot of quotes but we, from students and staff. I probably won't have time to read all those. But we have empirical evidence as well about the impact that this tool is having on students' writing. And there are links there you can follow up with. So I'm going to click through various quotes here, which are basically positive quotes overall. The tool's not perfect, of course. And I just want to mention two other examples you can follow up about tracking general capabilities, which I haven't had time to talk about, review and journey. And I'll stop there referring you to two books that I really recommend if you want to go deeper into this. Thanks very much, and I uh, look forward to chatting to you afterwards. We'll follow up by email. Thank you.